before I show a few projects, I just want to talk about the background um, to our work. Um, architects talk a lot. I never, I, I never anticipated when I studied architecture that <coughs> one would have to talk quite so much. I thought one of the advantages of drawing and being an architect was that one wouldn't have to talk. Um, but uh, as one gets more work, one has to talk more. And as projects get bigger, one has to talk more. Um, and at talking, <coughs> Uh, and, you know, and then one has to come to events like this and talk even more and justify and try and give rationale to the work that one does. Um, we talk because we have to convince. We have to convince clients, contractors, project managers, uh, consultants, and in some ways ourselves. One of the strange conditions of architecture uh, is that the time between conception and completion can be enormous. Um, you know, if one considers that most projects take three, four, or five years. We don't, therefore, deal in the same way that, let's say, artists do so directly with, with our evidence. We, we don't have <coughs> the evidence to prove how a building might be, and therefore we have to do a lot of convincing. Um, and this is a sort of paradox of architecture, that the one thing, architecture, that um, must be accepted on its own terms, does not require, in fact, can, cannot stand um, explanation or narrative, something to be experienced. The one thing that <coughs> doesn't require that uh, requires us to uh, be in this consistent state of explanation, discussion, and, and coercion. The reason I, <coughs> I say that, because I think that um, that distance that we have to carry projects from conception to realization <coughs> uh, is fundamental to the way that one thinks about work and organizes oneself. I want to show um, projects tonight with an emphasis on this issue. Architecture not as the product of architectural genius, but architecture <coughs> trying to interpret physical and contextual, and, sorry, physical and cultural context. In other words, the, the idea that, sorry, that buildings come out of not the sort of genius sketch and the genius idea and the sort of the work that one does in the studio, but actually out of a process of, of uh, collaboration, of listening, and of thinking about ways by which a building might be more uh, integrated, not just physically, not just, I'm not saying that in terms of <coughs> sort of fitting in, but that it might get its ideas from the very resistance that tends to exist against making architecture. The ambition, of our <coughs> the ambition of our work, we don't always succeed, is to find a way of naturalizing architecture, to find a level of proposal intervention that is a consequence of judgment and of appropriateness, appropriateness more than the display of creative assertiveness. Um, I'm, going to sort of, I'm going to talk about form. I mean, we are at a time where um, 
we, we can characterize the time we're in, I suppose, as, as, as a time where we are fascinated with form making. Architecture is, is enjoying a moment where more than I've experienced in my professional career. Um, there is an extraordinary freedom that is being um, exercised in the generation of form. And <coughs> that freedom seems to be uh, the consequence of a number of, of different things. But it also seems to be um, the, uh, the opposite side of, of a number of conditions. And one of those, a number of those conditions that concern me <coughs> are, first of all, the general um, interest in architecture as, the, as a sort of autonomous object. That while we've always, um, why one, why, while we shouldn't and we shouldn't dismiss the notion that architecture contains sculptural and autonomous qualities. They should not be the only qualities that architecture um, displays. Uh, secondly, going back to my first point, <coughs> that architecture is something that is profoundly physical and we find ourselves at a time when um, conveying those qualities and engaging those qualities into our work and justifying the inclusion of those qualities becomes more and more difficult. The construction industry is not particularly sympathetic to those ideas. The process by which we conceive and, and fulfill, sorry, not conceive, but process by which we fulfill and build projects is no longer a sort of guarantee of what one might call firmness. That just by building something does not guarantee its physical qualities. Okay, the final project is the um, America's Cup building in, in Valencia. Um, I don't know why it's called America's Cup anymore. You guys haven't had it for ages. Um, uh, the, paradoxically, the Swiss won it last time uh, and the time before. The, and when the Swiss won it, they, the, one, the, the benefit of winning the America's Cup uh, is that you, win the competi you, you not only win the cup, but you win the competition and the right to host the competition. Um, slightly wasted in, in the Swiss... Um, uh, <laughs> condition, uh, but they then had to uh, they then had to find somewhere that would offer them money to host it, and they settled on Valencia because Valencia offered them enough money, and we won a competition uh, to build a building for the America's Cup. Um, again, the program for that was a really uh, um, the program did not describe the building. I still can't really describe what the building is, or what it does, apart from essentially it's a building of privilege. It's a place where people with a tag uh, who are invited can go and have you know, breakfast or lunch or supper and watch the boats and assemble and meet sailors. And, uh, it's a sort of glorified yacht club. Uh, except the city's idea for bringing it uh, for the competition and for uh, instigating this building as a sort of flagship was that it should be the symbol of the development, redevelopment of the port and Valencia, Valencia's relationship to the sea. It was meant to be a popular building. So I said in the competition, how can you possibly make a building of privilege uh, the symbol of the, the city? Um, if, if you go towards the building and someone puts his hand up and stops you going there, um, I don't see how it's going to be that popular. Um, it will only represent the America's Cup, it won't represent the, the port or the idea of the, the harbour or the city's relationship to the sea. The concept for the building uh, started with uh, this idea of, of planes um, and 
the reason, well, no, let me start the other way around. There were two starting points. One was that, as I've already just said, it seemed to me that <coughs> the best way of describing this building was not by its program. It does contain a restaurant, it does contain meeting rooms, it does contain a whole lot of facilities. But actually, it's a place for hanging out. And if you're in Valencia in May and June, which are very wonderful months, it's, it's hot, and, but you know, you go to sea breeze, uh, you want to hang out on the outside. If you want to put balconies on a building uh, of this scale, then how do we do it? And in fact, what we decided to do was not to add balconies to a box, but to make the building out of balconies, so that they become a series of balconies. And that some of them are, you know, this floor is completely transparent. And that the whole idea then means that we can allow the public through this. So what happens is this is a public floor, this is a public floor, and in fact these, this is completely open, and therefore we can satisfy the desire for making a building that's both um, of privilege and of, of uh, popularity. So you can walk up here, you can come along here, and this whole level, there's a plaza up here, which is sort of pier, that runs through the building and connects, and you'll see in a second. Uh, there's a ramp that takes you up and brings you onto that floor, and that's a completely public level. Um, what we were also, so the, the interest was in a way less with the program space than with the unprogrammed space. And the idea, I mean, we had to, again, in the same way with the BBC, we had to fight for that central space. With these, this client, we had to fight for the balcony space. But in the event, you can see that it did become the most important space of the, of the building. And that um, whereas in Marbach we tried to define exterior space by columns and courtyards, we were interested here to see to what degree could, could the roof, could these roofs and the overlapping of roofs um, define space. And it became, I think, quite fascinating for us to, to see how convincing that the, these um, peripheral, these edge spaces became architecturally defined, not by the glass wall, but by the, the uh, ceilings themselves. The project had been delayed that when the Swiss came to Valencia, they had two years to do the project. There was then a change in, in uh, Spanish government uh, after the Madrid bombing. And the, uh, then there was a, a discordancy between local government and central government. And the project was delayed for a year, which meant that we had uh, 11 months to design and build the building, uh, which we just about achieved. And that shows how the building, this was in the first, in, well, when I say we just about achieved it, you can see that um, certain bits weren't finished. These were not clad. This was the first year. Um, they've now been completed because uh, the, the final races were last year, and in fact, Alingi won again, so the race will come back. So the, the building um, is guaranteed a longer life. I think that's the last slide. I just want to complete on, on that, which uh, I suppose just reinforces this theme that you know I'm interested in is, is the combination of a sort of physical architectural idea that I, the fact that that might generate form and that that form might link, be linked in some way by a sort of social or collective idea of the building and the role it plays in the city. Thank you very much.